All right, it's 6.30. We're going to go ahead and begin. I am Mark Tooley, President of the Institute on Religion and Democracy and Editor of Providence, a Journal of Christianity and American Foreign Policy. And we're delighted that this evening's conversation is focused on Iran. Always important, but especially important over these last uh, six months. And our speaker, we're very grateful for, Mariam Mira Sadaki, she can uh, correct my pronunciation, but she is the founder of the Cyrus Forum, which is working for a new and better and democratic Iran. The Institute on Religion and Democracy, of course, for 41 years, has been making Christian arguments for democracy, human rights, and religious freedom for all people. Uh, as I reflect on it, we were founded just two years after the Iranian Revolution, and remarkably, the same oppressive regime is still in power, but hopefully not much longer. This uh, talk, uh, we're grateful for those of you who are here physically. Please enjoy, enjoy the food and drink. And we're also grateful for those of you who are watching online through IRD's social media. This video will also be posted later. So hopefully it will reach a wide audience with this very important message about Iran, especially about the very courageous women in Iran who are resisting and fighting against the regime. So, Mariam, we've been looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you for caring about this issue. Um, I don't have prepared remarks. Uh, I have a few bullets here that I'll, I'll go through, but I just wanted to invite you all to ask questions so that I can really make my comments address your um, interests and uh, concerns. And I think it's, uh, you know, it's my honor to be at an institution that uh, values religious freedom and sees the inherent uh, uh, connection between religious liberty and um, freedom writ large. And um, the Iranian revolution was an Islamist uh, revolution, Islamo-Marxist revolution, that at its core um, forced religion or forced a certain type of religion onto people. And also at its core, and because of that, um, is very anti-woman. And the protests or the re revolution, really, that you see in Iran um, since the brutal killing of Mahsa Amini um, is a wholesale rejection of that ideology and of the last four decades of a totalitarian um, regime. Cyrus Forum um, is an organization which um, I founded just a few weeks before the killing of Mahsa Amini and the eruption of um, uh, these protests and strikes and basically a movement for um, overthrow, peaceful overthrow of a regime that is um, uh, very brutally, very nihilistically um, denying any kind of dignity for uh, the entirety of the population, including Shia Muslims who may actually even believe in its ideology. Um, so if you're interested more in that, on how a, a lot of um, dissidents um, are actually from what was considered or what is still uh, in the propaganda of the regime considered to be its base of support, the Mustazafin, the poor traditional um, religious uh, part of society is vehemently um, against uh, religious, religious government now and um, sees the inherent connection between this, this type of totalitarianism and the denial of any kind of economic freedom too. So no chance of having any kind of um, economic dignity either because of the lack of freedom. A lot of what I talk about I think is gonna be familiar to you because um, it's universal. Uh, it's the same kind of aspiration and the same kind of uh, inherent contradictions and crises that communism had. So Cyrus Forum, the name is uh, Cyrus, um, ancient uh, Iranian uh, king who believed in human rights, uh, um, very first uh, declaration of human rights, the Cyrus Cylinder uh, enshrined religious freedom and tolerance, equality, um, 
and he uh, freed the Jews and um, made sure that there was a spirit of tolerance in the kingdom that he ruled. So Cyrus Forum um, is also, or Cyrus is also the name of uh, the accords that followed or the, the hope for the, the accords that would follow Abraham Accords, which brought peace between um, Arab Muslim states and Israel. Recently, under the Trump administration, the Cyrus Forum, the Cyrus Accords, um, the hope is to have uh, uh, friendship, peace between a free Iran and the state of Israel. Um, as you all, I'm sure, know, the relationship between um, the Iranian people, the Jewish people, is is uh, enmeshed. Uh, Esther and Mordecai are uh, buried in Iran, and um, the spirit of religious tolerance towards Jews was strong prior to the revolution in Iran, and um, Iranian Jews uh, were, were n not that they were not persecuted against and not that there were not socially based hatreds against Jews, but the government was making huge strides to uh, empower them, and they were um, thriving, really, in the business community and in other ways. Um, let me see. So I think the most important thing from a Christian perspective, and I'm not, I'm not a believer of any faith, but uh, with respect to, to your beliefs, I think the most important thing to know, and I think you all already know it, is that there's profound suffering in Iran today. There is systemic torture. There is systemic rape of uh, 18,000, 20,000. It's hard to have an accurate number of people who've been protest who have been arrested for protesting just in this in this wave uh, in the last few months. Um, I think that this will also resonate with you that the only way to have a foreign policy that honors the aspirations of the Iranian people and their suffering is, is one and the same with having a foreign policy that meets the security interests of uh, America and the free world in general. <clears throat> Unfortunately, that's not where we are today. The Biden administration and uh, parts of Europe, um, Canada, are trying to do two things at once, say that they support the human rights of the Iranian people, their aspirations for a democratic country, um, the hope for uh, 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 the defeat of Islamism and a peaceful Middle East that would come with uh, overthrow of this regime, but at the same time they're still pursuing a nuclear deal with the regime, and this is um, this is impossible. Um, for one thing, any kind of deal, as we already saw with the JCPOA, with this regime, is something that is hollow. Is not. Uh, it's based on lies, <coughs> and uh, second, it requires a huge amount of appeasement and um, turning a blind eye to the human rights situation, the regional terrorism, the kidnapping and um, assassinations, even in Western countries, um, the global corruption uh, that is the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, the mafia, it's an international mafia, to get at that nuclear deal, which, it, which even on the nuclear issue itself is hollow and not trustworthy, um, you. We, uh, the West is uh, giving up on all these other fronts and endangering its own security. Now, I think it's uh, very important to say, well, but we have to figure out the nuclear issue, yes. But the thing is that so far what has worked, what has worked uh, to contain that nuclear program is um, uh, from the Israeli state, a program of sabotage and plants inside the regime and uh, very effective cyber attacks and espionage, and those things have held back the nuclear program and can do so, uh, particularly if all of that is combined with a maximum pressure campaign from the Western countries and a maximum support campaign to the people of Iran, particularly uh, the people need uh, to have 
more than rhetoric, and that's really all that we are seeing right now is human rights rhetoric from Western countries. Um, there are many things that worked in Eastern Europe when they were agitating for freedom from, from communism. A lot of those same <coughs> things are uh, applicable. So communications technologies, um, the United States spent lots of time and thought and money on making sure the solidarity movement in Poland, for example, had the means to communicate, to build its own capacity. Uh, that they had the means to go on strike for extended periods of time. All those things are the things that Iranians need today. Um, I think you know uh, for sure that a free Iran would be an Iran that honors religious freedom and uh, honors pluralism, uh, free speech, um, would go very, very far in creating peace in the Middle East region. Um, defeating this particular revolution would go a very long way to defeating Islamism in general um, because after the defeat of this regime it will be possible to provide much much more truth and clarity about how the regime has operated over the last 40 years to deny any kind of uh, human dignity. Um, let me stop there um, and answer your questions and hopefully we can discuss. Um, I'm curious, of course, <laughs> uh, there is no one answer, but obviously we're not doing enough as a nation to support the people of Iran. On the other hand, we've learned from some bitter experience that we can't necessarily control other nations. Yeah. So what would you suggest maybe increase diplomatic pressure or sanctions? Um, do you have ideas as to what we could could do that would, would help the people of Iran? Well, one thing that uh, is repeated a lot by activists across the political spectrum, Iranian political activists across the political spectrum, is, is not so much what to do to help the people, but just don't help the regime. So right now, um, the United States, Canada, European nations are holding out their hand to the regime and making sure that the regime doesn't get offended, that the regime will come back to the negotiating table. Um, they still haven't withdrawn that support to the regime and, and, and decided to invest in the people. I understand that there are a lot of bad memories from regime change and uh, attempts at changing um, the political landscape in the Middle East, but this is an entirely different situation. And in fact, what went so wrong in Syria had much to do with not doing the right thing against Iran's regime. By uh, the JCPOA is directly responsible for um, the United States not enforcing its own red line in Syria. So you know it's it's not making those mistakes that that is necessary. Not doing some really big thing that uh, has a huge price tag or requires any blood or treasure really. Uh, hi, my name is James. I'm the uh, managing editor of Providence Magazine. Um, we had a great piece, I think, yesterday from someone named Sheikh Atari, uh, another emigre from Iran. And um, the point of the piece was basically, well, one of the points of the piece was that um, Iran is no longer functionally an Islamic society. Uh, I, think I think it said only a plurality of Iranians, maybe like a third, even identify as Muslims at this point. Mm -hmm. um, of course, presumably, th that's the one third that is the best armed and most in most empowered, at least politically speaking. Um, and my kind of takeaway from the piece, I, it made me very sort of pessimistic about the outlook for the future of Iran. Um, well, on one hand, I do see some kind of regime change coming, because if it's the Islamic Republic of Iran and the number of self-identified Muslims continues to drop and drop and drop, um, clearly that theocratic basis for the state cannot continue. However, um, 
given that, like I said, that you know, uh, self-identified Muslims are increasingly a minority, but they're the best armed minority, it seems like some kind of civil war is sadly inevitable, that there will be a smaller and smaller minority of powerful but um, numerically inferior um, Islamists, I suppose, uh, working against a majority that is, you know, not as well funded or armed. Um, how, what do you think about that outlook? I think that when you look at the former Soviet Union, now granted, today's Russia is not a democracy, but, or, or let's say um, the Czech Republic, a be better example, Czechoslovakia at the time, um, the state was huge, and the state had huge resources militarily, financially, and uh, had employees, um, people working for it, people who, at least on the surface, uh, said that they believed in its ideology. But um, Czechoslovakia, Romania, Bulgaria, Poland, um, uh, the Baltic states, uh, the Soviet <coughs> Union itself, those regimes didn't come back to um, violently repress the people, even though the regimes obviously existed and they had a huge military arsenal. I mean, it's, I think it's, it's tempting to think that those people in Iran who identify as religious or Shia are necessarily going to hold up the state when they see that it's falling. Because I think that even within the regime, for example, um, Mir Hossein Mousavi is, is one of the most powerful people of, of the Islamic Republic. He was prime minister uh, during Khomeini. Um, he became uh, handpicked by the current Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei to be a presidential candidate in 2009. Um, he became a reformist candidate and um, that election was deemed fraudulent by the people. They came out, the Green Movement. Anyway, fast forward, he was put under house arrest. Today he's calling for a new constitution. He's basically asking, uh, the, demanding the same thing that stalwart Democrats have been, have been demanding for four decades. Now he may have other outlooks and interests and he may not exactly, it may, may be very self-serving at this point, but um, the important thing is that there are deep fissures within the regime, the ruling ranks, and there are defections. And that is an indication that whatever the, to me, that whatever the percentage of those uh, religious people are, they're not necessarily going to stand with the state. And just because you're religious doesn't mean that you support brutality. Mm -hmm. You could be a Muslim, but really hate this regime. My, uh, tell us a little bit about your own background. How did you come? I assume you were born in Iran, grew up in Iran. When did you move to the U.S.? Uh, where is your family? And uh, what uh, kind of contacts you have with remaining relatives in Iran? And what are they saying? Well, I was born in Iran. I was seven years old when the revolution happened. My family left Iran in 1979, during the six months after <coughs> Khomeini came back to Iran. And uh, I've always been really devoted to this cause. Um, uh, everybody I know in Iran, uh, everybody I know in Iran um, is hoping and praying and um, really invested in this regime being defeated. Um, there isn't a whole lot of difference when it comes to people across the political spectrum on that key demand of overthrow. And it took us it took us time to get here. I mean, the regime was very adept at using this um, <clears throat> rubric of reform to try and divide the uh, the dissent against it. So it took a long time to be rid of this this belief that uh, reform is possible. Good evening. In, in many of the former Soviet states that you referenced earlier, there were already civil society networks of various sorts to step in and help pick up the pieces, put together a new government, whether we're talking about labor movements or student unions or something like that. Are there organizations in civil society in Iran today that 
we could encourage now to prepare them for the day, the week, the month after the overthrow, if yeah. it happens. Yeah. Yes, there is a student movement, there are labor unions, there are uh, women's rights, um, there's a women's rights movement. Um, all kinds of uh, civic networks, uh, although they are very, very uh, brutally repressed. So another organization that I co-founded and co-directed and that is still going strong called Tavana is all about, Tavana is all about uh, building the capacity of civil society inside the country through um, education, dialogue, amplifying what they're doing and um, providing, Tavana Tech providing the uh, circumvention tools so that they can access a free internet and stay safe from surveillance. So there is a lot of that kind of work already and that's why we are where we are. The, the revolution is the result of a lot of civic capacity on the ground. What questions, comments? Well, thank you so much. Hayden, I know you have a question. Hi, thanks so much for coming. Um, you said that it would be better if the West supported the protesters and the freedom fighters than the regime, but can you be, can you give some examples of how we can do that? And I think you said something like we are, which is news to me. I don't know if someone knows something I don't, but I haven't seen any much evidence that our cur current government is really doing anything to help them. So what, what are they doing and what should they be doing? Yeah, I, I think that right now it's, it's a, uh, there's, as I mentioned, that there's a uh, hypocrisy there, that the rhetoric is there, but the action is actually in support of the regime. Because um, when, for example, the Biden administration tries to keep the United Kingdom from listing the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps as a terrorist entity, um, that's in effect uh, helping the killers of the Iranian people. Um, I'm sure as you followed Afghanistan, very similar. You know, you can talk all you want about the rights of the um, women of Afghanistan, but the, the policy delivered them to the Taliban. Um, or we know that China and Iran's regime are both uh, arming Putin's military against the Ukrainians, but we are not willing to put two and two together and be very honest about that and say, look, this is, this is really becoming a world war. China, Russia, and Iran are, uh, by way of Ukraine, uh, waging war on the democratic world. But what more can they do? I mean, if the first thing they have to do is have the right policy in terms of mindset that they're going to actually support the people of Iran. That has not happened yet. Once they do decide to support the people of Iran, um, a strike fund to help the people when they are striking, their families, um, communications technology, because in emergency internet access is critical. When the regime shuts off the internet, it can massacre people much more easily, so it's critical. Um, but really, the most important thing is to not do the negative act of supporting the regime. And the people of Iran themselves are very, very strong and will be much stronger when they see that the West is no longer behind the regime. This might be a very obvious question, or there might be a very obvious answer to this, but what is driving the Biden administration to pave in this way? You know, such a good question. What is driving the Biden administration to continue to back the regime, even though its rhetoric is uh, for democracy and for the people of Iran? I think one thing that is overarching or sort of superstructure, if you will, is that we're a very polarized country right now. And so very partisan. And in, unfortunately, even on foreign policy, when there's no need or benefit to having two views on one thing. We are determined to have two separate views that are opposing. Um, there used to be a much, much stronger tradition, in other words, of bipartisanship and foreign policy continuing from one administration to the next, even when the party changes. 
that's my long way of saying that the Trump administration had it right in terms of Iran policy, but because the Biden administration is from the opposing party, it has to go, you know. And of course, the the policy that existed before the Trump policy was the JCPOA, and there's vested interest in say, continuing to say that was the right policy, even though Obama himself has come out to say that, you know, we were really wrong not to back the protesters in 2009. That was a golden opportunity. Um, I think it's also uh, mm, the result of this poor policy is the result of putting the nuclear issue above everything else, no matter what the cost. And in fact, losing on the nuclear issue because of that. So having too myopic a view on the nuclear issue keeps us from solving the nuclear issue and along the way provides huge sums of money to increase regional terrorism, the corruption networks, um, the 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 assassinations and kidnappings and all of that that occur outside of Iran, particularly against dissidents, um, and basically the survival of the regime. I mean, and and the and and the Islamic Republic of Iran is is very very consciously using that as blackmail. The nuclear program is designed to keep the regime in place much more than it's designed to actually acquire the nuclear weapon. So do you think the Biden administration actually, or the State Department actually thinks that they're gaining something, or is this just contrarian? I think that, I think that Rob Malley in particular thinks that he's, he's doing the right thing by keeping the door open to negotiations. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. In the ebb and flow of the uh, protests, it seems as though we are at least hearing much less about them now than we were several months ago. Does that indicate that the protests themselves have subsided, or what are your impressions? Uh, if anybody is interested, I've been writing about this in Al Arabiya uh, on a weekly basis. Um, that ebb and, blow, ebb and <coughs> flow of the protests, um, I think we're always going to have that, but there is a real risk that we, we lose momentum, particularly because the repression is very brutal. That doesn't mean that, that the dissent will be quashed and it'll go somewhere. I think it's sort of like the, the laws of energy. It's gonna go, it, you, it, it can never disappear. It's gonna be somewhere in society. But is it going to take the form of mass protests and mass strikes and civil disobedience and huge, huge support from uh, global luminaries like J.K. Rowling and Jessica Chastain and all that. I don't know if we can sustain that for a long time. That's why it's very, very important for the West to wake up to the fact that it's, it's appeasing at the absolute worst possible time. There's a real, real, real chance to be rid of this regime, and the West is actually helping the regime to stay in power right now. Has there been any, been any outreach to Elon Musk to provide Starlink communications outside of the... Yes. Starlink is being provided. I don't know the numbers. I don't know how effective it is, but Starlink is being provided, not in the way that it has been provided for Ukraine, because obvious reasons. I mean, Ukraine is a country that is governed by a, a country... A, 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 the government of Ukraine can... can dialogue with Elon Musk and get the technology, whereas it needs to be the people of Iran in an underground way uh, getting the technology and the regime not finding out. It's quite different. So going back to your earlier remarks, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you referred to the uh, current Iranian regime as uh, Islamo-Marxist. Um, you know, ordinarily, I don't think the average person would put those two uh, ide ideologies together. So could you just unpack what that looks like, how it plays out yeah. in the current regime? Yeah, I think we're so used to thinking about it as an Islamic state, and we should be, that we forget that it, it's also a rentier economy, a command economy, uh, 
no one has any right to actually operate a successful business in Iran. Um, there's no merit-based uh, anything in Iran. Um, all of the economic problems that existed in, under communism really exist in Iran. It's just that because it's also Islamic, everybody's eyes and attention go to the religious tyranny aspect. But economically, um, Iran is an absolute shambles, and that's why it's uh, the highest brain drain country in the world. Um, and it's uh, the economic malaise, the corruption, is a big, big driver of the protests. Yes? Well, I, is there a specific logic that could be brought to bear against the theocracy as regards the, uh, the communist functions? I know that in Islam mm -hmm. there's a, there is a, a propensity of religion to share uh, the, to, the, to those who are in need. But at the same time, there's also, there isn't a communist bent to it. So is there a, a book or a logic structure that we can become aware of that how to debate that Islamo-Marxist state you're talking about? <clears throat> Maybe someplace in the theory of Islam as a religion, there's talk about giving to the poor. But in practice, this is a regime that has absolutely decimated society, steals from the poor on a daily basis, and the clerics and their families are living hedonistic lives in every way imaginable. Um, and if you ask me, this is real Islam in practice. There's no way to have Islamic government and have it turn out any way other than this. Just as it was not possible to have communism turn out any way other than it turned out. Uh, <laughs> it's a myth. It's a myth. Um, I think that's why it's really important for there to be separation of religion and state because if somebody really believes in giving to the poor, when it's not the government that is the religion, then they can give to the poor. They can be philanthropic. They can be generous. But once it's the once it's the state, any any kind of compassion or spirit is is gone. There's a very deep sense of disenchantment in Iran. There's an, an antipathy towards religion, uh, in general. I mean, but Islam in particular. Are there no-go areas? Are there no-go areas now in Iran where the police just don't go? And are those areas governed by maybe rebels, or, or is it, what? What's the situation there? No, no, no there is nothing like that. Okay. No. Well, I mean. I guess you could have no-go area anywhere, but I mean, I was yeah, watching all sure. these demonstrations, and I thought, wow, the police, maybe there are places they won't go. Right. When there were people out on the <coughs> streets and many, many, many parts of the country at one time, and particularly at night, yes, they were controlling blocks, they were controlling parts of cities, they were um, effectively in charge, but right now, no. Um, I don't know, I think somebody might have asked something along these lines, but do you think that we could and should somehow try to prov provide weapons for some, kind, some way to arm the people on the ground? Because I just don't see how, no matter what the numbers are, one side's armed and the other side isn't. And if we can't do it as a gov government, which does seem a little impractical, especially now, uh, I don't know if there's a way for nonprofits to do it, or do you have any comment on how to get the protesters armed? No, I don't think the protesters should be armed. I think that would be the kiss of death. I think that um, the regime is already, um, a totalitarian regime with that much power militarily can only be defeated through nonviolent means, unless 
there is an outside intervention. Because the amount of arms that you would have to send in to, to, to really do battle with a regime with that much military, uh, one, is not viable, and two, what would you be left with? The, 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 the whole country would be annihilated. We'd have Syria again. Um, so I know under the last administration, or what, under the maximum pressure uh, policy of, of severe sanctions, there was ample opportunity for severe corruption where certain um, licensed individuals were able to leave the country to try and exchange to foreign currencies, try and get around the sanctions, and many of them ended up taking very large cuts um, and growing like small, large fortunes. Um, what's really become of these types of groups? Also, once we reduced, uh, once we took away the maximum pressure uh, policy, how has Iran's economy been able to, 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 how has it responded? I'm not really familiar after, with, with kind of like what's happened in the past two years. Yeah, well before there was maximum pressure, the JCPOA, uh, people came out onto the streets um, and protested about how bad their economic lives were. So when the, when, you know, there was all that talk and promise from both the Obama administration, John Kerry, and the regime itself that the JCPOA is going to benefit the people and it's going to improve the human rights situation. Not only did that not happen, the opposite happened. And people were out on the streets protesting how bad they were doing economically. Um, I think it's regime disinformation that when sanctions are in place, then the regime does better. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's disinformation from the regime to get the sanctions lifted. Um, if it were true, they wouldn't be spending so much time and money lobbying to get the sanctions lifted. Um, it's a totalitarian regime, a rentier economy. Um, there are no freedoms. That's why the economy is the way it is. Do the sanctions hurt? The people, yes, absolutely. Um, but overwhelmingly, dissidents and ordinary Iranians say that they're willing to pay that price. I mean, look at them. They're paying much, much more of a price even than that to be rid of the regime. They're risking their lives. They're going to prison. And they view the economic uh, uh, penalty as something that is a necessary medicine. Well, thank you. No one has any other questions at follow up. Um, <laughs> you know, you've mentioned a few little coordinating dissident groups, uh, bringing in, uh, um, you know, emergency uh, uh, internet and, and ways in which we can kind of, you know, be proactive. But, you know, if you, if you had the ear of the Secretary of State and, and, and really wanted to be extremely proactive, well, what's a more, I don't, maybe not so far as arming, but like, are there ways in which we can coordinate more, um, I don't know, more direct responses? Again, uh, definitely not arming, and again, uh, it's not so much what we're asking for them to do, it's what we're asking them not to do. Mm -hmm. We're asking them not to engage the regime, not to leave the door open for another deal. Mm -hmm. And let's be frank, what does another deal mean? A massive injection of cash to the regime. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that was excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Mariam. Uh, I would refer you to her website. Uh, the address is cyrusforum.org. Yes. Yes. So certainly support her organization. And I'll also mention on a related note that uh, the person who recommended Mariam to us, uh, Nicole Bibbit Sadaka, Freedom House, will be speaking here Monday to our monthly New Wiggery Dinner, which is open to DC young professionals interested in classical liberty. So if you're not on the invite list, uh, please ask us to be invited, and uh, we will consider your request. And <laughs> you have to be young. <laughs> yes, you do. I'm sorry, Earl. And uh, also, on a related note, uh, our next event will be March the 8th, a uh, commemoration of Ronald Reagan's Evil Empire speech that we'll be hosting with the uh, Victims of Communism Museum across the street. Uh, that will be an afternoon event with uh, two panels. So if you're not on our, on our invite list, please let us know we're looking up online. Thank you so much for being here. Those of you who are here physically and those of you who are watching online in this video will be posting in a couple of days. Good night. <laughs>